Hello, mortals. I come here to take your... Oh, wait, no, wait. No, that's the wrong script. Sorry. Uh, welcome <laughs> to Software Circus, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present you uh, the next speaker, and that is Marcel Miller. He works at Jazz Farm, and he plays around with Kubernetes operators and release engineering. Okay, He's going to so talk to you about my favorite hobby, yes. and that is murder, daily you. murder. Please. There you go. Exactly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I want to start this off with kind of like a, a serious note. Um, the serious note being postmortems are a real thing. Um, don't look up postmortems on Google, especially not Google Images. So um, just a warning. I don't want anyone to have any serious harm from this. Postmortems are an engineering term but they're also very real term and it can be very disturbing to look this up on google images just as a quick reminder but now let's start with the fun part and the fun part is cosmotons and kubernetes and in kubernetes you have heard the phrase that has been said over and over again treat your clusters like cattle and that's exactly what i do every day I sit here, you see the cows behind me, you see the anatomy going on on screen right now. You know, we treat our clusters just like cattle. And these cattle, unfortunately, they can get hurt. They can get murdered. And at that point, we have to go ahead and make sure that we fix those cattle up again and we keep our cattle healthy and our herd strong. So from here, I want to quickly give some background on like, what do I do? Uh, what is my context like? Um, in the meantime, I have a lot of noise in my ears from from Zoom. If that could be muted, that would be, that would be one. Um, I'll just continue talking through the, through the noise. Um, how big is the herd? So we have, or we as Giants Swarm, where we work, um, have 200 plus clusters uh, created and managed by us. Those clusters are running on Azure, KVM, AWS, and on AWS also uh, in China. Those clusters are very large in, in, in some comparisons. So we have uh, quite big customers that have very large clusters. Those clusters need to be production ready and they need to be 24-7 uh, monitored. We need to do day two ops on those clusters. So we are a full managed service provider for those clusters. Um, and to really take that 24 7 ops load, we have 20 on callers ongoing. Um, so 20 on callers are taking care of these little cattle, fixing them up when they are broken, fixing them up when they are hurt, and really taking care of them. Just, just as an update, still have a lot of noise in my ears. So if we could mute that, that would be amazing. Um, next. So with these many clusters, as I have alluded to, we have a lot of issues. So not only do we have these clusters, we also have a lot of issues to go along with them. And fixing them is only the first step in the, in the process. You can imagine that, like, giving your cattle a little syringe, a little boost to make it through the day, because if something goes wrong, we can't let the cluster go down. We can't risk some downtime. You apply a quick fix, you mitigate the actual incident, and then the next step is going to be like, what do we do now? The actual incident is maybe over, but next up, it might not be so going so well. And the follow-up part from the incident is basically what we refer to here as the postmortem. Okay, so the incident has happened. Our poor cattle got slaughtered by a vicious incident and now we have to follow up on this incident create a postmortem and fix it at the root of the cause so obviously we didn't come up with a definition for postmortems we didn't have the idea to take a medical term <laughs> and apply it to software engineering instead uh, a lot smarter people than me and and probably most people came up with the postmortem definition, and I just want to highlight here out of the Google SRE book, some of the, the most uh, important parts. That is, there's like a multi-stage kind of situation going on that defines a postmortem. So first, the incident needs to be documented. Then all contributing root causes um, should be well understood. Like after you've uh, documented the incident, hopefully while it's going on. And then you put in some preventive action 
uh, in place that should reduce the likelihood or the impact of reoccurrence. So what does that mean? We don't necessarily always, sometimes the world just isn't in our way, right? I'm covered in blood. The world is definitely not going in my way. Um, and that kind of means that we cannot always fix the root cause, but we can take preventive action. We can make it the reoccurrence less likely. We can make the reoccurrence less impactful on us. So next time we're hopefully not covered in blood, but it's only a few sprinkles of blood hitting us. From here, I want to go through these different stages and how we do them in Giant Swarm. So the first one would obviously be um, document the incident. That should happen while the incident is happening. Um, in Giant Swarm, we utilize Slack and GitHub a lot. Um, during the incident, there's lots of conversations going on in Slack, maybe in chat rooms, maybe here, maybe there. But the point where we collect all this information for us is a GitHub issue. So we have a GitHub issue. That is the main point where we collect all information related to an incident. Um, so there we know who worked on it, which actions were taken, include some explanations as to what we did, links to chat logs, links to like just logs from machines, maybe from containers, whatever you've got, you include it here, you link it here. It's kind of the main hub for all the information during the incident. And also the one that has been the first person responding to this incident, like the first responder to this terrible murder of our beautiful cattle, um, should estimate kind of roughly the, the impact of a reoccurrence. Like, will it happen to, uh, tomorrow again? And will an entire cluster go down? That would be terrible because that, that's the highest degree of murder. Is it just like a small problem? And maybe it will only occur once every 15 years, then it's not such a big deal, right? So kind of estimating like, what do we currently think is the impact to kind of allow us to maybe, um, yeah, plan out the next steps better. So from here, um, the postmortem is created, which in our case is the GitHub issue. And now it gets assigned to a team. Uh, we have normal cross-functional teams. I've displayed this here in my wonderful graphic. And from there, the postmortem basically gets distributed to a team usually or should be a team that is uh, working on a related topic to the postmortem. Example being if the postmortem has hap uh, happened on Azure, so the, in uh, the incident only related to Azure, then the postmortem will most likely land in a team that is working on our Azure installations and our Azure clusters. There it goes to the um, uh, product owner of the team, which is wonderfully displayed here as an orange smiley, and is then distributed out to a, a team member who is then responsible for the postmortem and works on the next steps. What are the next steps? Okay, we continue to document findings. So we are on the search of a root cause or some mitigation now. The incident happened is kind of okay for now. We put a band-aid on it. Now we really want to find either root cause or find something to make the occurrence even less likely or to even yeah, kind of rule out a reoccurrence. And for this, we continue to use the initial GitHub issue. So we kind of time, backs our, time box our effort here for finding a root cause. So we don't spend months trying to find a root cause for a postmortem when we could just find like maybe just a remedy that works short term. So we try to time box and then reevaluate with the team. We pull in people to pair with. So it's not, even though it's assigned maybe to one person, it's not a single person's responsibility to spend their entire life now fixing this problem. Um, because different people have different inputs, pull in people as quickly as possible or when necessary and really try to work on this uh, together. And the ideal outcome of this phase is we've documented what happened, we've documented what we now discovered in like a discovery phase and we were able to reproduce the issue in a safer environment. That means in kind of like a test environment, we are able to, wow, we, we have this issue nailed down, okay? Uh, it's kind of cruel, like look at this beautiful cow behind me, we would take a test cow that is expendable and we would reproduce the horrible murder on a test cow. Um, that would be the ideal outcome. Then the final step is again time box to two hours usually, um, or we try to time box. This is obviously not always uh, possible, and we implement some preventive action. What can preventive action now include? Obviously, could include like fix the actual issue. Like if you have the root cause and it's an easy fix, 
it will only take two hours to fix, just fix the root cause. Um, but most of the time, the world doesn't work out like that. So you need to add an alert for the faulty behavior, or you need to disable some feature for the meantime where this problem can occur um, to kind of have an immediate preventive action that even more lowers the chance of recurrence. And the lowest kind of thing you can do that has like the least um, programmatic impact, let's put it like that, is like just communicate the root cause. If you know the root cause, then you should communicate it internally and also externally, maybe to our customers, to kind of say, if this reoccurs, we know the root cause, therefore we know exactly what to do and we can respond quicker the next time if it reoccurs. This is simply an option that is very valuable, especially in our experience, because you can say that, hey, I can't fix this problem right now. It's a root cause that's not under my control, but communicating the root cause internally and externally enables everyone in your team to respond that much quicker and to really fix the issue the next time it occurs much quicker. So from here, I want to give a quick example. Um, so this is a sample controller manager does not update the ready state of a daemon set or of daemon sets. Um, as you can see here, we have followed some of the steps already. So first of all, we documented uh, the incident. Salvo, my colleague here, uh, Mazi89, um, documented the incident by creating this postmortem issue on GitHub. In the next step, um, it got assigned to a team and inside the team, it got assigned ownership, which is my beautiful face on the right here. So assign ownership, that's my beautiful face covered in less blood, but this postmortem got assigned to me to work on and to kind of lead the investigation and the uh, solution of it. And then we also documented the findings. I don't want to bore you with now 50 comments, but there's 50 comments in this postmortem detailing where did it happen again, what kind of findings did we have, what happened. Obviously, you're probably also interested in, hey, what was our preventive action? And our preventive action in the first place was communicating, communicating primarily internally, because this issue, while it is a misrepresentation, did not have any direct impact on the customers. It was only basically a, a demon set displaying that it's not satisfied, even though all pods are run. So um, to document this um, postmortem and to make recurrence like less likely and less impactful, we then, uh, I went ahead and wrote this little snippet of instructions of what to do if you get paged by this error again and you want to rule out that it's not this faulty behavior. So as you can see, the title, demon set not satisfied, but all pods running. Then it has some uh, instructions on what to look for, instructions on what to do, and basically a, a remedy at the bottom. Hey, you can fix this easily with these four steps. We call these little snippets um, ops recipes in Giant Swarm internal. I know in other companies, they have different names. So other companies might call them um, ops playbooks or, or other variations on playbook. Um, we, we call them ops recipe internally, kind of like legacy, but that, that's the name we have for now. Um, and these are really often created. Um, and from this uh, preventive action, we can now also see on the GitHub issue that uh, we have some automation. So as we saw before, there was postmortem was created by Salvo. There were lots of labels applied. I was uh, assigned ownership. And we have all these states which we are going through. And as Giant Swarm, we also made sure to kind of start automating that a bit more. Because as we'll see later, we have a lot of postmortems that we deal with. And this automation makes it easier. So here is, for example, a check if the postmortem was created correctly and can enter kind of an accepting state that it can get brought to a team or to a team member to be worked on. Um, I don't want to bore you with the details, obviously, but at the top, you can see which labels are applied. So all of these GitHub uh, issues have a lot of labels with kind of an impact estimation, postmortem label, the state they're in, and the alert that caused them. This is kind of important for the next point because I also want to show you what our Slack integration looks like. So on the one hand, we have the GitHub world where we have all of these documented postmortems and they are findable there with different labels. But on top of that, we have an integration in our alerting stack, which ends in Slack. So here you can see an alert manager notification 
for exactly what we discussed earlier, 10 cluster daemon set not satisfied. So again, the daemon set was not satisfied. Same postmortem as before could be the cause. And you can see multiple buttons here at the bottom. First button is obviously ops recipe. This will open the ops recipe related to the alert 10 cluster daemon set not satisfied. And in this ops recipe, you will find exactly the text that uh, is written down there. So this is the, the first thing. Then you can find linked PMs. Linked PMs will open up your um, browser with GitHub and will show you all the postmortems that have the label of this um, name applied. So you can find those very easily as well. Query is a very simple one. You can open, uh, it will open Prometheus for you, the correct Prometheus for where this happened. And you can directly query that Prometheus for additional information. Dashboard is a Grafana dashboard. And my favorite button is the silence button. If you realize like this is not an actual issue, you can silence it. Um, most likely you still need to create a postmortem because you got paged needlessly and possibly woken up at night. From here, the question that should ring in your head would be, that's all nice, Marcel, but I don't want to be covered in blood all the time. I don't want to, I don't want to wrestle those cattle all the time and fix them up again. So how can I solve the actual root cause? And this is a, um, a bigger topic, obviously, and it's very much dependent on the postmortem you're working on. But solving the root cause, the first thing we always should realize is if it's potentially a bigger story, we need to plan out this bigger story. This means that it might take more time and it might take less preference over some other stories. So even though we work on a postmortem with very high priority to kind of put a band-aid on it, we have to accept that sometimes fixing the root cause cannot be our highest priority immediately. So we kind of want to balance out fighting fires with actual implementation and making the situation better long term. Because if you always try to fix the root cause of any minuscule problem, you could run into the issue that you are just fighting fires. You're just trying to fix the root cause of every problem you're experiencing over and over again. And then obviously um, this should be then evaluated during a team planning. Um, so your team should have some say in how much time do we actually spend here? When do we do this? And plan this really out as a team and it's then no longer as much as in a postmortem on your actual person. Now some realities, some giant swarm postmortem realities. As you can see, I'm still covered in blood. We currently have 38, uh, as of yesterday, 38 open postmortem and 1,557 uh, closed postmortems in our GitHub. So those numbers should be quite large and uh, showing up quite large to you. Um, the reality is that postmortems, in the case, in the sense we handle them, happen a lot, and this is why we need such a structured process to deal with them. And the second reality is also 99% of these postmortems are not very exciting. Okay, remember we have 20 full-time on-callers. Obviously everyone in a team can work on a postmortem, but keeping these postmortems down and keeping the number of incidents down is obviously a very high priority for us. And having 99% of these postmortems not very exciting, it needs some commitment to work on. And obviously there is some level of planning involved to make sure that postmortems are getting worked on because a lot of the time they're not very exciting. That leads me to the third point. Currently in Giant Swarm, if a team has more than five, roughly five, there's some leeway here. Uh, unmitigated postmortems. So that means postmortems where a problem is happening, has a, recurrent, has a chance of recurrence, and we have put in no band aid, no quick fix, no nothing, then they focus on nothing else for the time being. So they go in kind of this postmortem mode where they focus all their time and energy on working on their postmortems they have assigned to their team or area. Kind of a harsh reality, but as you can see, sometimes it's necessary to prevent more bloodshed. So now I want to give you a few little cases, little samples of horror 
the most horrifying stories. And you should have soon a poll show up on Brella, I think the website is called, uh, on the right side where you can select some answers. There should be like four answer selections. I think only three of them really make sense, but you can select the fourth one if you want. Um, and the scenario I want to present to you and where you can guess what was the root cause is, first of all, we have a cluster. All nodes are ready, okay? They're all ready, they all look fine. They're all saying, we are fine. All our cattle are screaming, we are okay. But you look into their eyes and they're in deep pain. Many pods are terminating across the entire cluster. So they're all terminating all over the place and they're stuck in terminating. So they're not disappearing. So you know for certain something is, something is amiss here. New, there's no new nodes joining the cluster, even though Maybe the autoscaler has scaled up your cluster. There's no new node scaling. So it's very freaky. But the most freaky part of all is the KS API server logs are full of requests without responses. So the API server is shooting loads of requests, but none of them are coming back. Now, what, what, is, your, what is your guess, people? Do you have, do you have any input on what, what has happened here? As you can see here, we are, we are currently the man on the right maybe your left, standing on top of the mountain of skulls, considering what has murdered our beautiful cattle. And the solution, the solution what happened is uh, quite straightforward, but I see it more and more often all across the internet, all across our clusters. A cluster had a open policy agent webhook, but all the open policy agent pods were killed at once during cluster scaling. So maybe some nodes were removed. Maybe a lot of nodes were removed. Maybe a lot of nodes were rolled and all our open policy agent pods were killed. Now, how does Kubernetes, the API server react when a webhook is gone that has requested previously all information to go through it? Exactly. It doesn't answer ever again. It does nothing anymore. Now, as you can see, this is obviously not a good scenario to be in. Um, you suddenly end up in a cluster that's completely dysfunctional um, but on a first look, it might look fine. Um, now, also, what's the solution for this, right? It's a kind of misconfigured webhook maybe, but also should all the pods disappear at once? Can you always say that? So even with HA in like open policy agent, so I've seen this happen with two or three open policy agent replicas. If you don't set up the pod disruption policy correctly, even then, you can run into this scenario with a bit of bad luck and you've suddenly deadlocked your cluster. The remedy is pretty easy then. The remedy is you, you edit your API server or you remove the uh, validation webhook configuration from your API server and everything starts functioning again. Then you add the uh, policy back in place. It's not a nice fix, but we have a fix. I want to show you another case, another tale of horror. Once again, in a little bit of time, you should have a little poll pop up with another four answers, possible answers to this mystery. And once again, we stand on top of the pile of bones and we, we ponder, we ponder as to what happened. The, the scenario is as follows. We have nodes that become unresponsive sporadically. So suddenly some nodes just like don't answer anymore. And we also realize that the nodes experience memory exhaustion. So they run out of memory, but the workload on our nodes is not consuming enough memory. The workloads has all limits set. So it's not our workload. We also notice that prior to it becoming unresponsive, there's a lot of Docker plaque latency that increases on sporadic nodes straight across the cluster. You can have a hundred nodes inside the cluster and one in every 15 hours has this issue, but it's consistent and it's causing outages because it can happen to multiple nodes at once if you're unlucky and you can't get to the bottom of it. You're, you, you're covered in blood, you're going crazy. And you also notice eventually that maybe Docker emits incredible amounts of uh, events. Like you're looking at the Docker events and it's every millisecond there's a Docker event. Now you take your best shot, take your best guess as to what happened. And now I will, I will reveal to you what happened. I, I'm that generous. I will even reveal to you <laughs> what has happened in this in this terrible case. Um, this was actually a very interesting problem that I personally had to uh, worked on for 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 a long time. 
Um, and my first expectation was maybe the same as you had um, the first expectation. Um, I expected it to be an issue related to Docker because we see all these Docker events and it doesn't make sense. But the reality was this was a problem with a specific Linux kernel version reacting in a very unexpected way to C group limits being reached. So some port would reach its C group limit and normally that port would then get restarted or like the process would get restarted. You know how C groups work hopefully. Um, but instead of getting restarted, the operating system would keep the process alive and it would kind of become a zombie process that was constantly uh, reaching its C group limit. So every time Docker checked or every time the uh, operating system checked the C group limits, it would event, uh, it would emit a low level event that the C group has been breached, the limit has been breached, but it wouldn't kill the process. So the operating system was emitting all these events on like a lower level. Docker was picking up on all of these events on a higher level and was then emitting all of these events again to the Docker event stream that you can see by like Docker daemon logs or whatever. Um, uh, Docker daemon events, sorry. So this exploded the Docker memory usage because Docker just couldn't keep up with all the events that were being fired. So you would literally have Docker take up all the memory. And the problem was limiting the Docker memory wouldn't help because Docker would reach its memory, memory limit so quickly, it would restart and before all the pods are kind of responding again and lag plate and uh, plaque latency is okay again, Docker would get restarted again because I just reached its limit again. So you could really deadlock any node with this behavior. The conclusion here, we never found the definitive root cause. We can definitely say that changing the Linux kernel version helped. I cannot pinpoint in any place where this was the actual 100% cause. It was kind of a relation to Docker version reacting in this way, kernel reacting in this way, workload maybe having some weird behavior where it kept the zombies around. So it was a whole combination. Very frustrating to deal with, but the murder got cleared up at the end. We upgraded the kernel version and we were fine. Now, finally, as we reach the end of this spooky presentation, I want to take, give you some takeaways from, from all that we've learned now. Um, that we have also learned a giant swarm and that I want to give to you if you've watched this and found this helpful. So a structured process helps us share knowledge specifically in regards to postmortems. Really the st structured design of postmortems and the very structured way of how we record all this information and the places where we keep this information and keeping it consistent helps us share knowledge between team members and between um, people that are on call in maybe different areas and different time zones, for example. So really, it gives us a structured base to share the knowledge that we need to mitigate um, all these issues and all these incidents, as well as keeping it kind of lean. We're not building a giant process, but we're keeping it kind of lean, right? We're only having like GitHub involved and maybe Slack and the implementation is not very heavy. There's not 15 hoops you need to jump through to actually create a postmortem. You have a template, you click create postmortem, everything's generated for you, you fill in the information, you're done. Um, that kind of enables us to still be fast in this process. Then stability increases over time. The more you work with postmortems, the easier it gets to, to kind of have a, a stability increase over time. You won't notice it immediately and you will have times where postmortems are overwhelming maybe, but then it's a time to take a step back and realize, okay, what is our focus here? How can we fix the situation? Otherwise, if you don't have a structured process and you don't have like documentation about which incidents actually happened, what were they related to? What was the outcome of these incidents? It gets even harder for you to evaluate what are the correct next steps to take. And then, um, this is more like a culture thing. Postmortems, in my opinion, synergize in the way we implement them very well with a no blame culture. It's not about blaming anyone in the postmortem. It's an incident that has happened. That incident gets documented. And it's on a very technical level where blame doesn't even play any part of it. It's about improving the process, improving the product, improving how you work with Kubernetes in our case. 
that really helps us keep a no blame culture alive and keep a healthy culture alive. And then finally, I also want to uh, uh, mention that again, that fighting fires versus fundamental improvements is kind of a takeaway from this. So it's not always so clear cut that, hey, I'm just gonna work on postmortems and I'm going to be fine. No, you need to kind of balance it out against, hey, I'm fighting a fire right now because I'm just like fixing small issues and I'm not under, uh, working on the underlying root cause versus I'm just digging into every root cause available and not working on any features anymore. So there needs to be a balance and this is always a, a struggle. I think in general in software engineering or whatever you do in, in, in terms of technology, but it especially appears here. And then finally, I want to present you a beautiful heart and say thank you all for listening. Um, if you have questions, you can meet me at a conference, you can DM me on Twitter, you can reach out to me on whatever channel you want. Please also follow up on Giant Swarm for any of your, yeah, manage Kubernetes needs in case you have them. Um, and I want to thank you very much. And I also want to thank um, Puya, a colleague of mine, um, who originally um, held the first version of this talk, I think now two years ago, whose talk I have completely taken over now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk, Marcel. Uh, this was very interesting. I love how much murder was in it. Uh, I think we don't have questions on the chat right now, but like he said, you can get in touch uh, through many ways on the internet. And there's also our Slack, which you can find on the More tab umbrella. Uh, so I think we are wrapping this up now and we're all coming back here in a few minutes. <laughs>